Let's go ahead and get, get going then with uh, our, our study of John then. So we left off last week with John 5, and uh, it, that's a really good sort of stepping off point where, you know, again, we, we're, you know, we're caught in this awesome, majestic prologue where John is trying to make sure that, sort of in a way even that isn't covered as much within the Synoptic Gospels, that we see the hand of God working, the invisible hand of God, working in the visible world. Um, we'll go over all this. Uh, so our goal is to go to verse 11 tonight. That's our goal. Uh, and I think we'll do it. I think we'll be, we'll be there. Um, but uh, we left off with verse 5, which was, uh, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Uh, the darkness, or the darkness has not comprehended it, right? We thought about that. Again, we're going to see this again in our verses in tonight as well, but there's always within John a conflict between light and lightness and darkness, the light and the dark. Um, that's going to come up again and again and again, and that actually helps us to understand what's happening. Um, when we look at verses 6 through 11, we're going to again be put through the lens of Genesis 1 through 5. So we look at verse 6 um, straight off the bat. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, that's, the ESV is an interesting translation of that. They go with, there was a man sent from God, which it, it, in, in, you know, in, in the actual Greek, we have something closer to there came, or it came a man. So this is Egonecto uh, Anthropos, right? So Anthropos is human, man, like anthropology, right, right, right. And Egonecto, remember that's that Genesis, that creation word. So there's a sense here that you don't really get with ESV of, again, we're back in Genesis. So, this, so if you think about it, it isn't sort of like, who sent it? It isn't like a man got like sort of sent like a, like a telegram and said, go here. God created a man, right? That's that creation verb. So God created a man, and what was that man's purpose? That man was sent from God. And really cool, you have this, you have apostelemos, or apostelmenos, which is, in its root, is apostelos, and which, sound, which is the sent ones, the apostles, right? You get that same idea. So God created a man, just like you have in Genesis 1, right? Where God creates a man. God creates a man and sends him, right? And that man is sent para from, that, oh, from God. So God creates a man and sends him. That's a much stronger vision in some ways that we have kind of, there was a man sent from God. You get this sense of that this wasn't just sort of an accident, that there's some kind of person. Like this is all from ground up a plan that's being put forward. You really get that sense there when you think about it in that, in that light. Um, and, and I love this. Uh, his name, Otto Onoma Ianes. John, his name, John, his name was John, right? So the, the English, we, uh, uh, if, you, if you look at the King James Version, it'll have words like was, because there's no was here, it'll have it in italics to tell you that they added that word in. That's what they did. Though that's often confused the lay reader who's tried to emphasize every word that's italicized, which is not, that's how it's italicized, because that's what we do in English, right? If a word's italicized. The King James translator is one to have that, so a little, little marker that, hey, we added in a word. The ESV doesn't do that, but you, you get that sense that in order to make this make sense, you add in those, those coordinating words. Um, so you get this name, his name was John. What's fascinating, uh, you know, as, as we kind of look at this, um, is that there's not much introduction to who John is. It just sort of, yeah, his name was John. So what, that, what we assume then, uh, or what we, only we can assume from that, is that John was a historical figure people knew. It's somebody you didn't have to tell everybody about. I mean, if, I, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're aware of the happenings in uh, Judah over this period, you knew who this John was that he's talking about. He's going to describe him a little bit more, obviously, we're going to go into, into his work. But he doesn't have to go like father and son. He doesn't go through the whole, you know, Matthew gives us a whole lot of information about who this John is, some of his lineage, everything about that. He just goes, and his name is John. And the thing you need to know about John is that God created him and sent him. On his way. Well, at that point, okay, I don't really need to know who his dad is at that point. 
if I know God created him and that's out of nothing, right? That's that ex nihilio, that, 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 that Genesis creation, created him and sent him. That's, okay, that's, that's his resume, is God created me and sent me uh, out. Which, which, you know, that, that should give us a pause when you think about what's the resume of the apostles, too. And they're the ones created by God and called and sent out. Right? That's fascinating. But there's a very special, special role for John, right? Okay, a couple other things. Again, I, I said that, um, you know, what is this office? What is this office of, 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 of sort of the sent one? Uh, Thomas Aquinas, the great uh, 13th century um, Dominican, uh, you know, who basically, you know, forgot more about Western, you know, what, I mean, he wrote more about Western theology. Pretty much, you know, the, the line goes from Augustine through Aquinas to now, right, for all intents and purposes. Um, and his famous uh, work, the Summa Theologica, the sum of all theology, is a, is, is a massive tome uh, um, that is a, a, a brilliant, a brilliant work where he tries to figure out everything. I mean, it's one of like the like the great systematic theologies uh, is, is is the Summa. Um, and and what's great about it is uh, it's the most non-postmodern thing. It's all realist. Aquinas believes we can know things. We can know truths. Um, and anybody who deals with people uh, on, on college campuses or things like that now, you all know, oh, what's this truth, that truth, it's your truth, my truth, whatever. Aquinas says that's nonsense. We can know truth, right? Uh, but anyway, he, he, he said this office was like that of an angel. It's not the nature of an angel, but it's a messenger, right? So it's, a, it's the office of an angel that John, that John has here. Uh, it's an interesting way of putting that. We think about that. Um, and that's also so the office of the apostles um, as is God's messengers, um, human messengers in the world, um, flesh and blood sent out uh, uh, to, be, to be what we'll, what we'll, what we'll work in. But the next, the next verse is going to tell us all about what this actual role is. Thanks, John. He's, he's got our back. John's got our back up. So what? So God picked some guy and sent him. For what purpose? John answers our question in verse 7. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. So lots of cool stuff in this verse, too. Um, so the, the Greek word for witness, um, you, you, you'll see it here. So um, he came as a witness. And this is martyreon. Martyrion. So, where, what does that word sound like? Martyrion. Martyr. martyr, right? So, witness and martyr are pretty much the exact same word. In the, in the early church, to be a witness of Christ was to be, you're almost certainly going to be martyred. Or you're going to be killed. So, the word kind of became synonymous with that same kind of idea. That being a witness of Christ meant that you were going to be a martyr. So, martyr, but it killed, so martyr just kind of became a term for being, being killed for the faith. But every witness is, is meant to be, uh, I mean, the, the, the word is martyr, right? So that's the sense here um, that we have as well. And of course, John will be killed, right? John will be beheaded later on. But that, that's that sense of being a witness to that. And so why is he, you know, but witness, you know, we, we have, it has all this baggage, right, on top of it as being sort of a Christian thing, right? So we have sort of, we think of martyrs, even today, there are martyrs all over the world who are dying for the faith. Um, that has that baggage on top of it. But before that, what did the word mean? What is John saying? Absent all of that baggage that gets put on it, that's important. Well, it was a legal term, witness. Right, it's the same as our legal system, right? If someone says, oh, I, we need a witness, right? It's a legal term. Um, and and it, what it basically means in, in this Greek period, and it's a lot of the ways, same thing it means now, um, of testifying or bearing witness to the true state of affairs by one who has fuller knowledge or a superior position. So he's, he's saying that John is picked by God, chosen to be a witness to the thing we're talking about. And what's the thing we're talking about? What's the, what's the big important thing that's happening? The incarnation. So, I mean, the, 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 the most important event in the history of humanity is the incarnation. Right, I mean that, that that's the big moment. Now, of course, that you know the the apex of the incarnation is the crucifixion and resurrection. But without the incarnation, without without God becoming human, right? 
And, and John is a primary witness, a legal witness to this thing. An expert witness, in fact, indeed. Yeah, an expert witness in this, right? Uh, a, a, one of the great ways to think about our faith, or really whether or not our faith is reasonable, right? I, 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 our faith is imminently reasonable. Our faith is rational. Um, there are lots of faiths that are not. They're irrational. Matter of fact, as, as our nation becomes less and less Christian, it doesn't become less religious, it just becomes less rationally religious. People start to believe all sorts of crazy, wild, nonsense things that make no sense whatsoever. So this, when, so when John wants you to think about, well, should I believe all this? Again and again, the case that John's going to make, the case that Paul's going to make is, look at the witnesses, get them on the stand, put them on trial. And if you have hundreds of witnesses who say a thing happened, who say all these things happened, who are willing to die for that testimony, then in a court of law, that's going to hold up, right? Again and again and again. And if you say, no, I don't believe it, um, you're like a judge who's refusing to believe the testimony of people who've come forward, right? If, if 13 people came in and said, that's the guy who did it, and the judge went, uh, no, nah, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't buy it, and the jury went, no, nah, I don't buy it, that would be a jury not doing their job. That would be an irrational action by the jury and the judge. It's the same thing as we go through all of John's gospel. When you have this evidence in front of you, you go, nah, I'm good. I don't believe it. That's, that's a miscarriage of justice. You said to these witnesses, oftentimes who have died, to give this to you, eh, no, I don't believe you. I don't want to. I don't want to believe you. I don't want to believe it. And that's, that's, that puts us on trial, right? Now we're some of the ones who are, who are guilty of a miscarriage of justice. The onus is back on us, as it always is throughout this, really. It's just we, we come to it in our modern, modern mind, modern Western liberal minds, with the idea that we are the ones, this has to perform for us, this has to show us the truth. I'm the judge. And boom, you suddenly can go, oh wait, I'm in a different courtroom and there are witnesses telling me what's, what's happening. This is a dip, I'm, in a, I'm not the judge. It was fascinating to think about. All right, uh, what, what, what else can we, can we, can we get from, can we, can we talk about verse seven? Um, oh yeah, this, this great idea of pistusin, uh, 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 the, like the make them believe. Um, so that's like, so pistuo uh, 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 is, uh, is faith, trust, right? So the idea here is, uh, and there, there are a few different ways to, to translate that, but you know, it, in the ESV, they have might believe through him, you know, might come to believe. That's the idea here of, uh, of all this from this eyewitness, from this witness of these things, right? I mean, when we, when we think of the synoptics, John is a witness from the womb, right? Remember when Elizabeth and Mary come, and, and John in her womb is filled with the Holy Spirit, which is a fascinating thing that one can be filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb, right? Which makes perfect sense since we know that's, that's how Jesus is, the incarnation happens, right? But it's still fascinating to consider that, particularly in arguments where, where we started talking about is a person a person in the womb? The Bible certainly thinks so in every, in every way. And it's, it's something to be celebrated in, in, in a beautiful, wonderful thing. Uh, this is important, especially true for people who've been through things like miscarriages, who have been through stillborns. That this isn't just a thing of, of nothingness, that that hurt you feel is real, um, but it's a person who is still welcomed into, into God's arms and still someone who God knows, right? And that's their, it's, it's his person. So that, that's a lot, there's a lot of comfort there that we've kind of, as a modern world, thrown away um, uh, in, in honor of the sexual revolution, but we, 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 that's just nowhere to be found here, thank God. So, let's move on to, to verse 8. Any question on, on that, by the way? I want to ask more. That really makes John stand out in that sense, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, John is incredibly important. John John really is the, the hinge point between the Old and New Testament. Right? When, when, you know, Jesus says you know, he's the greatest man born of woman, but mm -hmm. the least of the kingdom of God will be greater than he. Uh, the point he's making is the point he's making is that all of this, all the prophets have been leading up to John. John is the prophet part, you know, the, 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 the great prophet that all those prophets were leading up to. Uh, that doesn't take away from Jesus' prophetic 
stance as well. But he's the last Old Testament prophet who's in the New, he's just in the New Testament, right? Um, because it's all connected. There's not like a definitive break between old and new, right? We just do that to kind of help us kind of figure out talking about covenants and things. But yeah, and he's the last Old Testament prophet. He's, he's the hinge point between all of this. Um, and we're going to go into more about who he is as we as we. Because the only apostle who's referred to as his beloved, isn't it? Well, not that. That's that John the Evangelist. Oh. Yes. So so John the beloved okay. disciple. That's the way John. That that that's, that's this would get confusing in his book. But John the Evangelist never refers to himself as John in the book. The only person who's called, there's a couple other people, but the only person who's normally called John is John the Baptist. But he doesn't call him the Baptist, he just calls him John. John the Evangelist, he calls the disciple whom Jesus loved. His whole identity is based upon his, the way Jesus loves him. He doesn't have a name. My name is that Jesus loves me. Like, I mean, that, that's, that's a fact, I and mean, that's an amazing testimony to who he is. I mean, you get that sense too when Paul says, you know, I'm. I'm, I'm the least of the disciples. I'm a slave to Christ. I got no problems. He's got no problem saying that in a world where slaves were nothing and, and the worst of everything. Um, but yeah, I love that about John in, 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 in this. Because the book is anonymous, right? John doesn't put his name on it. Everybody knew it was John. That's why his name gets put on like, the first time they copy it. But I mean, it's John, John's, you know, John says, this isn't about me. It's about Jesus. And so he doesn't even put his, you know, his own name. This is, so, is Jesus' book. That's why there's, certain, you know, there's a certain sense that we call it, I hate calling it John's gospel, because it's, it's, John would probably hate that. It is Jesus' gospel that John happens to be a, a witness of, of all of this, and he's, and he's blessed by all that. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's, that's what he would, he would really, really want. Uh, and you get that from his book. It doesn't start off, hi, I'm John, I'm, I, yeah. Jesus loved me, and I was the best. Yeah. Now, and, you know, I, it doesn't give an autobiography of himself, doesn't, yeah, none of that matters. No ego. No ego. <laughs> Zero ego. But ego is gone. You know, I mean, our identity, I mean, that's the coolest thing. Our identity is in Christ. You know what I mean? Right. So it's not about us. It's it who isn't. are we without? Who are we without? You know, so. We're nothing. Right. I mean, that, that's so really, that's, that's, that's hard, though, to tell modern people, though. Yeah. Especially yeah. modern 21st century Americans, to tell them that they're, that they're literally nothing not without him. Exactly. You're not no. Not who you think you are. No. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I don't <laughs> think so. Uh, uh, I, you know, I'm, I, you know. We all have these accomplishments that we've done and all these things that sort of we're told build up our identity and make us who we are. And those things can, you know, on a sliding scale are good and bad. I mean, there, there are plenty of bad things people do that they define them, right? Um, but at the end of the day, um, our status as being citizens of eternity matters whether we're in Christ or not. Right, exactly. and, and, and so our, what we're going to experience in the new world to come, um, what will be our real lives when we look back on them, ways and in terms of that that will be defined by a relation by who who Christ says we are. Right. Um, this is John talking about John the Baptist. Right. John the Evangelist talking about John the Baptist. Yeah yeah I'm sorry I'm, I'm, I, it's all gonna come as we get along. I, I probably should have prefaced that a little bit when I say yeah, this is not yeah he says he, he's, he doesn't really care about himself as a witness right? yeah is, is that in that regard no it's all about John the Baptist is is is, is where we are here. But again the readers, like, we're confused a little bit there, but the reader is the readers with a bit. Like, okay, John Baptist, got it. He's, he's the witness, right? I mean, Jesus calls him, you know, the Elijah. Like, the, uh, he's, he's the Elijah who comes before, right? Not literally. He's not literally, it's not reincarnation. Right. This sure, is no. like, I, I've actually literally heard people say this before. Like, he's Elijah reincarnated. No, abort. We're not Hindus. Abort, yeah. abort, <laughs> abort. That's not a thing. Like, stop, we'll hold back. Because um, Elijah shows up, right, at the Transfiguration. Yeah. That'd be really weird. That'd be, that'd be awkward if they're the same guy, right? right? Um, so that's a, so yeah, so it's awkward, yeah. So no, no, no. But it's 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 a metaphor, folks. Like that's he's saying that you know, he's the Elijah who 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 uh, uh, who comes before, because that was of course an Old Testament prophecy. Anyway, all right. So let's keep going in, in verse, verse eight. Uh, he was not the light. Again, this he uh, who is who is this calling back to? Um, What's interesting is that the he is part of the verb here, the hain. He was not the light. So phos is light, right? Um, the, the, the sentence is actually kind of interesting uh, because the came to bear is actually earlier, but it gets kind of, when you throw it around in the, in, 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 the, in, in, in the English. So he was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. So John wants to make it, John the evangelist wants to make it perfectly clear that 
John the Baptist is not the light, which is something John the Baptist is at pains to, to say. It should also be pointed out, I, I, I probably don't need to do this for this room, but it's something that comes up, and people ask me about this all the time. John the Baptist was not like the first like Baptist. Like oh. the first, like, <laughs> people ask me this all the time. I know it's silly. Yeah. Like yeah, I mean, it's, it's like like you'll literally get people tell you like when the when like when the Baptist denomination start, they'll be like, Psh, Psh, John what, Fred? I got you right here. Psh, Psh. Like, Duh, there's John the Baptist. I mean, he doesn't call it Baptist, but you know, Matthew what? Or whatever, whatever, whatever. No, 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 Fred, no, um, no, that's not it at all. Uh, so he's the bat. One way you, you call him the baptizer, right? That's it's, it's his role, right? Um, is his baptism the same as Jesus' baptism? No, it's not. That's something you've got to be very careful of. There are lots of ritual washings. Lots of ritual washings in Judaism. Um, like one, for instance, if you're going from becoming not a Jew to becoming a Jew, you have to go through a ritual washing. Um, a mikvah, right? It's, it's, it's um, but the, uh, in this case, it's not Trinitarian. I, you can make the argument, though, that the first Trinitarian baptism is when? There's an argument that can be made that the first Trinitarian baptism is Jesus' baptism. Because it's the first time you have a baptism where the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit are both present all at the same time. And so when we baptize ever after, Jesus says, baptize in Matthew 28 in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Ghost, right? Um, so there's a huge difference, though, between that baptism and the baptism John's doing. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a baptism of, uh, of repentance. It's a baptism of preparing. And, and imagine what John is saying to people, right? He's saying to Jews, the chosen people, you need to wash yourselves and get clean because the Lord is coming. The Messiah is coming, right? That was, that's why the Pharisees are mad at him, right? They come down to the water and they start arguing. It, it's because he's saying to them, you're dirty and unclean, even though the whole Pharisaic system is designed about keeping yourself clean. I mean, that's combative language that he's saying. That this is a, this is a this is why this is this is a big deal that's going on there. He's saying you're not clean. You need to get clean in this in this in this water right now and get ready uh, and repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, so that that sense of you know we we need to hear that a lot, even as Christians too. That you know, uh, you know that sort of that that, that mantra, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's one reason we do Lent. I mean, it's one big part of it. Is reminding ourselves that uh, the King is coming. Um, and we need to be clean and we need to be ready. Uh, so all that's going on. We'll, we'll, we'll get to more of that as we, kind of, as, we kind of, as we kind of work our way through. But that's a really, I mean, so, so John's greatness, what makes John great isn't him personally, John the, John the baptizer or John the Baptist. <coughs> it is that the object that he defines is great. Like he's defined by the light. So there's a sense in which you have this, he's a reflection of that, right? It isn't that the light's coming out of him. John's not, you know, it, it isn't like the, the Buddha finding his inner light, right? And he's sitting under a tree, right? It's not like that. It, it's, it's, it's the light of Christ shining off of him in, 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 the, in the world, right? Because we've already established that Jesus is the light, right? And that those first five verses where we talked about, he's the light, he's the light. That's, that's the light. So John is, is, is a witness to that light. It's a reflective beam of that light back into the world. Um, which is, which, is, which is a big deal. Um, all right, verse nine. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. So, came the light. So, phos is light, like uh, the phosphorescent we talked about. So, the phos, the aletheon, which is the true, true, the true light. The light, so it really, literally, this is the light, the true, but it's, you know, maybe easier in English, we, we say, but, but it's emphasized, right? I mean, it's, it's definitive. So you have two articles on there. So it's, literally it says, <coughs> the light, the truth. So the true light, right? Um, and this light shines to all men. So it's a light that shines, uh, 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 which shines on all men, but the, the ESV translates that as, but gives light to everyone, right? I mean, that, that's the sense here. Um, was coming into the world. So now, what we had before is we were talking about the light that was there at the beginning, that was creating that light, right? 
But now we see that this light is Erkelman, coming into, entering into a stone cosmos, into the world. So like a cosmonaut, right? Um, this is a fascinating word. We're going to talk about how John uses cosmon. Cosmos is the word, is the root word, the cosmos. Uh, we think of cosmos because of cosmonaut. It's basically like space, right? I'm going to cosmos in space. The cosmos has this much bigger, interesting meaning um, in, in, in Greek. Um, and John is the, is the master of, of using this word. Um, and he call, So it always gets translated as the world, right? But anyone who's familiar with his gospel or his letters knows John uses this, this idea of the world in a really flexible, interesting way. And we're going to talk about how he's going to use it, both here and throughout, throughout the rest of the book. The next verse is the one where this really becomes key. The, the, so far, this is the first time he uses it. It's in the next verse where he kind of goes, goes all out. But we'll get there. But remember, what is this light? This is the light of all lights, the light par excellence, the light of lights, right? The light from which all of the lights are, 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 are derived, right? Um, and, you know, the light represents uh, a, a revelation, right, in itself. Um, but remember, when light goes into the world, in John's gospel, what happens? What does the darkness try to do? Tries to overtake it. When, 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 because now the light, we know, we know the light was all there earlier, so if I can go up here. The light was there creating the world, right? And now the light is coming to earth, right? And we know already from verse 5 where it says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness is not overcome it. So both in creation, the darkness couldn't stand the light. Uh, but now we have a, a new situation. The light is heading into into uh, uh, into the world of man, coming into the world, into the cosmos. Um, so again, the, the light and darkness are always in combat in this sense here, right? But there's always, we have to be careful. We, we don't want to turn this into dualism, right? So for instance, uh, the old name for this was Manichaeism. There are lots of dualist systems, yin and yangs. Like when I was a kid, when I was in high school, every idiot had this stupid yin and yang like sort of thing on like a necklace. Uh, it, they didn't know what it was, but it was like this kind of look cool kind of thing, like this balance, right? The really bad one, though, it, and you know, they, they, is, is, uh, is Star Wars, of course, which makes about a billion dollars every time they make a movie now. Um, and uh, it is this whole idea of the light, uh, uh, or, or the, the, the dark side of the force and the light side of the force, right? The good, good, good sides. And they're always, they have to, you know, they're kind of always combating each other, and they always have to be in, in, in equal balance, this whole thing. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, the sort of George Lucas's kind of pop mood, kind of, kind of, kind of uh, 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 pop sense of this kind of idea, this kind of pop manichaeism. Uh, it, it's, it's, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, you know, the the trick we have to understand is if you turn on a light in a room, what happens to the darkness? It goes away. The darkness doesn't like have a chance to fight back, right? Like, and so we have to be really careful when we think about this sort of struggle between light and darkness. It isn't one darkness can win, right? There's no sense in which, you know, you're watching Star Wars, oh man, Darth Vader might kill Luke Skywalker, this whole thing might end. No, I mean, don't get me wrong, I mean, you know, the light usually wins in those movies too, or, they, or we wouldn't have another movie, but uh, uh, but as a sense, in, 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 in the reality, it's it's not like that. It's, it's not a sense in which there's any chance of failure of the light to destroy, to, 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 to win in the darkness. Um, so that's something we have to be really careful of. Um, sort of dualist systems. Uh, you'll get really weird people like who had kind of weird ideas about like having like the balance in their life. They have to do like good things and bad things. They get all balanced out. Those kind of, you probably, karma is a system like that. I'd be able to talk about, I gotta do a certain number of good things and a certain number of bad things. And again, not Hindus folks. Uh, and if you really, nobody really wants that system because it's, it's dark side is, is the old caste system. Um, which actually, if anybody who's ever read any kind of like Rudyard Kipling, like uh, uh, in the Jungle Book, uh, there's that there's situ there's a scene where Mowgli um, tries to help out. He goes in the human village and he tries to help out uh, someone who's struggling with a cart, um, but he's been adopted by the rich lady in town, and he gets scolded by the priest for trying to help that guy. Why? Why? Well, because that guy must have been bad in a past life. That's why he's struggling and that's why he's poor. You weren't, that's why you're rich and that's why you're blessed. That's the dark side of that system, 
right? So literally, don't help that person because they're getting what they deserve. You can see how this could get bad really, really quickly. Whereas it's the opposite in Christianity where, you know, I have to sacrifice everything I can to help that person who's being oppressed by an evil world, right? An evil cosmos, right? I already had that second. But that's a huge difference. So people, oh, people love the idea of karma. No, that's a really terrible, terrible system when it really gets down to it. I mean, it's, it's taken a long time to break up the caste system in India, and it's really held them back in a lot of ways. There's still remnants of it. Um, uh, it it's, it's, it's a destructive, horrible, bad system. Um, but in any event, people love to shoot their mouths off about karma. We don't believe in karma. It's awful in karma. No, they, I don't. But I mean, but but frankly, it's it's you know the idea there's it's it's rampant in religion that you get what you deserve. I want to get what I deserve. I want to get my desserts. And, and the problem is that's just not how Christianity works. And if it is, we're all doomed. Right? And that, that's that, that's a problem. I mean, if that's the case, you just don't need. You just don't need all of this. You just you can just you can close up the John book, John's book. You don't need John. You don't even need. You don't need any of this. You don't need John's the Gospel of John. It's, it's all up. Just don't worry about it. Have a good day. Uh, pack up. Just just go just go help lay the ladies across the street. You'll you'll be okay. Which is comforting. That's okay. I get. I get helping old ladies across the street. It's harder for me to wrap my head around l sacrificially loving as Jesus does. That's harder to wrap my head around. But like, sort of keeping a list of all the bad things I do and all the good things I do. That, that's really easy. Uh, and that's our that's our natural way of trying to control God by making Him do do what we want. But we, we're not. That's not our situation. So, first step. This is awesome. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. So, so here's the thing. You've got world three times. I told you, this, this is the verse. And it all kind of, and it all, this is why we've got to talk about world. So you've got, so he was, he was in the world, he was in the world, and the world, and, and he Made again, again, so again, that making, that Genesis word, right? So he's, he's the one who is, he's the one who made the world, right? Um, and, and the world, uh, the world didn't Ed know him. It did not know him. Didn't Ed know. Didn't know him. So that this, the scene in our brain you have to think about is the creator of the universe comes to the earth. The world he made and people don't know him. And that no, right, isn't just sort of like don't recognize him. And that's part of it. But it's really a sense of um, kind of that, that old Old Testament idea of knowing, like they didn't they didn't believe him, they didn't follow him, they didn't have a relationship with him. Can you imagine the creator of everything comes down to earth and people are just eh. and worse, and that's it's going to get worse than that. But that's like usually we jump right to the fact that humanity murdered him. That's bad. That's really really bad. That's not good. But also the fact that people just didn't. Didn't. We're so blinded by their sin and blinded by uh, by their selfishness that they didn't notice that that they couldn't comprehend that here was God. Even though he's going around doing all the things that God would do, right? He's raising people from the dead. He's 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 healing people. He's he's doing all these things, right? And people say, nah, nah, I don't buy it. I'm good. All the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. I mean, it, it, with this, we're going to talk about world. Who does John include in that? Remember last time we talked about the darkness? Who does John include in the darkness? John, John has a big net on the old darkness. Um, John includes himself. He includes the, 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 the other guys who were there and just and didn't get it. And we're, we're opposing him. Think of St. Peter, even. Like St. Peter is, you know, his, his declaration that Jesus is the Christ, right? And then, you know, Two paragraphs later, he says to Jesus, I'm not going to let you let you die. I won't let you yeah. be a sacrifice. I'm going to be the one, who, you know, I, I, I'm the one. I won't let that happen. And Jesus says to him, you don't understand any of this whatsoever. You get behind me, Satan. Because he said, because this, this, that's Satan coming out of your mouth. Right? I mean, that, that, that's, that, I mean that, that's tough stuff. Right? But that, that gives us a sense of just how much we need to be rehabilitated from our sin. If we have any, if we have any sense that ah, I'm not that bad, remember that we would, we would be standing in front of the creator of the world and going, nah. But we do that all the time anyway. We do that all the time when we hear Jesus say things in his word and go, 
nah, I'm probably not going to do that. I, I, that's really hard. So if we, if, 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 if confronted by that, um, I have to tell you, I mean, that, that's, 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 the, that's the tough thing about this, is that's the same reaction we would, we would have without the Holy Spirit in, in, his, in his presence. Anyway. That's the same. With the human brain, we can't really grasp that, can we? I mean, our brain can grasp an awful lot. Yes. But I, 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 you know, it's the problem is is that we're uh, we like sin too. Like that's the thing we yeah. really like. Um, and 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 we're just, you know, we, we have uh, a, a condition that needs to be healed and cured. Um, and the healer and curer comes, and we murder it. And that that that's, that just should just give us a sense of who we are, as 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 what we need, right? Um, and we, and you know, the more we back away from that, the more we kind of blame other people. We kind of, mm-hmm. oh, I wouldn't have done that. I I would have been there. Mm-hmm. Survey says no. no Survey says no. You, you wouldn't be. Exactly. You you you'd be you'd be, you'd be Peter and the others hiding someplace. Right. May, right. You know, Absolutely. probably not even with John at the foot of the cross. Right. Remember this John? Mm-hmm. The John is yeah. writing to us. Yeah. Uh, who doesn't even say he was the, his name? Yeah. That he was the one there, right? That John, mm-hmm. yeah, pro- probably not. But that—that's a sense. So, what does this cosmos word mean? That kind of plays right into this idea. So, it can mean sort of the physical universe. It can mean that. Um, it can mean the, like the world, the physicalness of the world. Um, but it can also mean like the universe as sort of a, a personal entity, or kind of as as the relationship with its creator, right? And humanity goes into that too. So the cosmos is us as well. As we stand with the God who stands outside of creation, who made creation, right? I mean, God is always outside of that, always transcendent of, of creation, right? Uh, he's about to become supremely imminent too. He goes into creation too. Mm-hmm. Imminent is, is uh, not uh, I, but imminent is, is a word, is a, just a theological term for being. Be with next to around, right? Um, so Craig Keener has uh, the 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 comment uh, who wrote an excellent commentary on John has, has a really good summary of how, what what the world means to John. He says the world is thus the arena of the light's salvific invasion of darkness. The arena of the light's salvific invasion of darkness. That's the cosmos. The lost that Jesus came to seek and save. So when we think of the darkness, it's easy for us to think of it just being like the darkness. But that's us too. Like you know, that's it's not just the creepy vampire in the background, the werewolf. It's us, right? I mean, I'll, remember it, it's something about those those horror images, right, of, of monsters. Remember they always turn back and forth between humans and the monster, right? And the good question is, which one is the more monstrous? Uh, is is it's always a tough question in those in this in those in those horror stories, uh, but yeah, I, I I think that that that's something we have to see there is that the the the, the world of the darkness there's, there's a lot of synonymous uh, there's really kind of synonymous terms in some ways, uh, but it's the it's the space in which Jesus has entered into to save, so it's the creation itself, Jesus has come to save that, just as he's come to save us, right? He's come to save us to put us. To restore us as stewards and you know, really kings and queens over that creation. I mean, you get that in you know, reread Romans 8. I mean, that's the point Paul's making when he talks about the idea that the, the creation is waiting for the sons of God to reveal themselves. And he means the heirs. He means those in Christ. He means the people who will be the citizens of the new world. So everything is just waiting for that to happen, even now. So Jesus comes into the creation to save it and us, um, and to redeem it, and to re- remake it, to recreate, to, re- to regenesis it, right? The creator has come. And whether or not we recognize him or know it in this, in this way, it isn't going to stop. Matter of fact, we can kill him, and it won't stop. Right? So that, that, that's a heck of a thing. Um, but John's not in a rush to get there, and neither should we. That's why you know this may seem like we're taking a long time in this, but we can't be in a rush to just get to the get to the get to the get to the end. Tell me, tell me the end, because all this stuff really, really matters in terms of thinking about who Christ is, deep and deep, deep into it, and how that affects us in reality. 
Um, Yeah, um, so sort of the rest of John is a story of how we failed to recognize him. Like, and there's a certain sense in which you, if you're going to define the rest of this book in terms of the human participation, uh, you, you could say that it, it's a book about how the, the creator came in, um, he was in the world, uh, and the world he made, the world did not know him, right? Uh, didn't even recognize him. Even at the end, right? Even at the resurrection. He comes out of, he's, he's, he's arisen, and Mary Magdalene is in, is, in, is, is in the garden, as John calls it, um, which, is, which, is, which is obviously is, is not back to the Garden, garden of Eden. Um, and, she, and she doesn't recognize him. He's risen, risen himself. She doesn't, she doesn't recognize him. She calls him the gardener, mm -hmm. uh, which is, a, of course, a connection back to Adam, the, the, first, the first gardener, uh, the first steward over creation. Uh, and so, it, like the whole story could just be nobody noticed, nobody gets it, right? Which, which, which is, which is something. Uh, now she does recognize him because why does she recognize him? Because he tells her who he is. He reveals himself, which is also the story of John. The story of John is us not getting it, and Jesus constantly revealing himself to us, and then, and then, and then making us know who he is, even though we don't want to. So badly that we kill him. We just don't want to know. Who so badly, but still, he just he just he just gushes out the need to save us and love us all throughout all throughout the book. Um, uh, and so we're, we're going to end on eleven, which is just like we're going to end on a real tragic note, of course. Um, and, and you know, ten ten was bad. Ten's bad. Ten's ten's not yeah. good for the old human race. But eleven is 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 even worse. Um, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. So this is even worse than it is in English. <laughs> so I'm going to it that way. Uh, it's bad in English. Uh, but this is actually, uh, John does a, a, a figure of speech, which is really interesting. He, he plays with the uh, gender. Because uh, gender, by the way, only is in language. We use gender to talk about biology all the time, but that's not a thing. In my, like, when I say gender, I mean how a noun is inflected, how a word is inflected, right? Uh, I mean, you know, like, you know, uh, uh, like cosmos has male gender, it doesn't mean that the cosmos is <laughs> biologically male, right? Uh, English is weird because we don't really have this, but anybody who knows Spanish, anybody who knows other languages, this is a common, common thing. You know, table is female, it doesn't mean that the table yeah, is, is, right. is biologically yeah. female, but I, I mean, we, we use gender in, in English to, to talk about biology. It's, it's, it's one reason we're very, very confused about everything, but <laughs> anyway, this, as, as an English teacher, this makes me crazy, uh, and, but in Greek, you got gender all over the place, and it has nothing to do with things being Anyway, all right, that's, that's one of my pet peeves. Um, but this is, the, this is the, how this works. So he, he writes into uh, his own. Into his own, he came. So own here is idia, and then idiou. Uh, but there are two genders. Uh, one's masculine and one's feminine. Um, and what that actually means, when you see his, he came into his own, it, it, it isn't, think of it as, came to what belongs to him. He comes to this earth and this people that are his possession, his property, the thing, I mean, I, I, but I don't, it's, it's more intimate than that, but it's that too. I mean, if you create something, if you make something, it's yours, right? You don't get to just, no one just gets to pretend that, that, that it's not. Uh, I mean, we have copyright laws. We have all sorts of things that protect, you know, what you create yourself, right? And, and so he comes to the people to his own, to, to the people that belong to him. Um, so he, he doesn't come to the world as his home. His home is in heaven, right? He comes to the earth, to the people that he owns. Think of the parable of the wicked tenants, right? Um, where God has a, a vineyard that people are working in it, um, and God sends people to the, to, to, to the vineyard to get uh, the portion that they're supposed to give back to him, and they kill all the, all, all, all the people who go. And finally, they kill his son and say, now we'll be ours. Now this is ours. And then he goes through and just wipes them all out um, and then puts new people in there. Um, that takes on some real sense here that this is all everything he owns, right? And, and despite that, we're not going to really recognize not only our creator, but literally the person who, who, who owns us, um, who, who, who we belong to. 
um, in, in, in a real sense of that, a sense of that term. Um, it's, it's a more intimate relationship than property, I, 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 but that's, that's, it's that too, right? Um, it, it's like, think about something that you worked on your whole life, some invention, some creation, like a piece of music. I imagine how Beethoven felt deaf after he finished his ninth symphony. Like, what, what did that feel like? Like, something on a scale far grander than that is humanity, the creation. God comes to that's his, he's, and, and, it, and it kills him. Like, that's, that's, that's the vision, it, it, does, it hates him. It spits in his face. Um, it wouldn't even exist if he wasn't there, uh, if he hadn't made it and they hate him for it. Uh, which, which is a pretty common thing, actually, um, in, 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 in humanity. Uh, you know, we're, we, we tend to not like, not, we don't want to be beholden to someone, right? I think how often sons rebel against their fathers uh, or daughters against their, 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 their mothers. And, and, that, and that's, you know, why do you think that, I mean, that, that's a command, right? Don't do that. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's a bad, horrible thing to do, uh, but it happens all the time. And think, hopefully, the people kind of grow up and turn around and it, all, and it kind of gets better. But often, sometimes it just doesn't. It's, there's a natural, sinful nature in us that, that, that wants to do that. So that's that first clause. It shows that the intimacy of the Creator. It's this beautiful creation He's made that He loves. Um, and then the second clause, this, this whole idea of He went to His own people and they did not receive Him. Um, so they show Jesus appears and His own people, the, uh, of course, you know, this, His own people, what, what does that remind us of? Uh, it reminds us, of course, of the Old Testament. God's chosen people, the, the, the people that he's chosen out of the whole world, starting with Abraham, the, 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 the old barren idol maker um, who, he, he, who he calls out and begins the line that would end in the incarnation, right? That begins this, right? Um, all of that. So those people there should, have self, should have received Jesus with celebration and joy and love, um, and they don't. They don't. Um, this is again. This isn't a, a special. This isn't a special dump on uh, on, on on the Jews of the Israelites. Um, it is a, a, a. It is a. So much of what the Bible is doing here is it's giving us a personal scale to understand the tragedy of what's happening. Because it's one thing to say all of humanity hated him and 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 didn't recognize him. It's different to say your family doesn't recognize you, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's, that's, that's a different scale, right? It's scaling down to the, so we can experience in a real way what this is like, like coming home and, and not recognizing, being recognized by your family. Right? That's how far down we've kind of gone here. This is, as I say, this isn't a special focus on those, like this isn't anti-Semitism, that's not what this is, but it's a focus that make us feel what that would be like to be your special chosen people who you've, you've shepherded through all this time and, and, and you come to meet them in human form uh, and, and they kill you, right? That's, that, that's, that, that, that's the pain of this vision is. Um, and, what it, and what it does is it, is it reveals that the people who should have welcomed him home are part of the darkness too, right? It, it, it recognizes that just, I mean, just as we were talking about earlier, like everybody, you know, well, who's, part of that, who's part of that world, who's part of that darkness that's opposing him, um, it's, it's the very people who should have loved him and, and, and brought him in. Because you think of these, these Israelites wandering. Sure. They're so stubborn. They're so stubborn. When you look at the Jews, because they have never accepted. Well, but again, I mean, again, this, this, isn't, this isn't a matter of, this is a matter of putting a magnifying glass on humanity. So whenever we think about you know, what's going on in Exodus, what's going on with the Israelites throughout the kingdom period, like, well, what, what is this about? Why do I need to see this, right? Mm-hmm. It, is a, it is to give us a, a close in magnifying glass on how terrible human nature really is mm-hmm. and how desperately we need a savior. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and you know, that, that, there's a lot of other things going on, but that's a big, big part of it. So when we see the stubbornness of the Israelites in in, in, in the desert. There's a reason that our morning prayer service, we say every day Psalm 95, which goes way, way back to what's still said in Latin, because Psalm 95 is a psalm about praising God every day, but it ends with a, with a warning. It ends with a warning that we need to not be like the 
the wanderers in the desert who rebelled against God, who didn't listen to his word. Because again and again, Paul makes the point uh, that we are a people, like, you know, who, where are we? You know, his, his great analogy for where, he, where Christians are right now is in the wilderness. The exodus has happened. The great, like, why did the exodus happen? The exodus was to give us some sense of understanding pointing towards the cross, right? We've been freed from Pharaoh. Now we're in the wilderness. And that's okay, because God's taking care of us. He's feeding us, right, with, you know, uh, with, 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 with the Eucharist. He's giving us everything we need to get through it. The question is, uh, will, will we be faithful to him through that? Right? I mean, that's, I mean, Paul makes that direct point. Like he'll, even, like, he'll even say mysterious things like, the rock they drank out of, the water, that was Christ. Mm-hmm. Like, that's how close. Like, when he's, so when he's reading Exodus, he sees Christ. Right? And so that's, how, that's our situation, too. Whether we're in an actual desert, which some people are, or here, we're in the wilderness. So that heaven is our promised land. We're, 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 we're working, like you say, we're working through the wilderness now. Like, where's the promised land? But, it, promise but it's land. even bigger, like, like um, so when people were dying there, where were they going? They were going to, you know, sometimes it's called Abraham's bosom uh, is one way it's term, but they're going, they were going to, 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 you know, a intermediary space, which is, which is heaven. But again, the promised land is a real land. The promised land is the new heaven and the new earth, mm-hmm. new earth. Mm-hmm. So in that vision of Jerusalem coming down in Revelation, right? Coming down where? To earth. Yeah. A new earth is, is the vision here. So, so heaven is part of that, but heaven is kind of a staging land. ground. Heaven is kind of like England before D-Day, right? D-Day is the day in which Christ returns and brings the armies of heaven with him, including all the saints in life, including us if it happens. It's like that image of a rapture, right? The image is we get, you go up, but you don't stay up. Yeah. That's what? No, you go up to be with him as he comes down, and it's a new world. Right? So it, there's, only one, there's only one second coming. I mean, otherwise, it would be three comings, four comings, right? I don't know what's confusing. Um, so yeah, there's only one second coming. It's, it's happening, boom. And, it's, and it's, it's the new heaven, the new earth. So, I mean, you know, that may be our fate. But in any event, it's still, you know, an, an interme- intermediary spot. It's the beachhead before coming back and uniting heaven and earth forever, um, which is an, which an important thing to keep in mind. Um, when we think about what's our, what's our goals, what's, you know, uh, uh, you know what, are, what, are, what, are, you know, what are we doing on earth even, that those things matter, right? Because this is still going to be our home when, 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 uh, when we return to it, I mean, one way or the other. Um, so that, that, that's it. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 there's a beautiful continuity there. So, I mean, when we think of, like, the, the land, the land matters. The land is a thing. The land's going to be, I mean, that's still, that promise is going to be kept. 100% kept promise. God doesn't break his promises. It's just, it's bigger than we can even imagine. Yeah. Like, when, when you think of the dimensions of the, the New Jerusalem, you know, it's inc- vastly bigger than the actual Jerusalem. Vast, and that's one city in this new heaven. So you imagine how big the new creation is going to be. It's going to be enormous. Um, and then it's going to also include the, the whole universe, right? The, the whole cosmos. I mean, that, that's, that's the great thing about all of this um, that, that we have coming, coming through to us. Um, but there won't be no more moon or sun, right? There won't be any moon or sun. Well, when we, the light will come from... Right, so when we... we either, so, in Revelation, when it's trying to kind of describe to us what that world is going to be like, remember, you know, Revelation is unlike the rest of the Bible, which is actually kind of there, Daniel is like this too, because it's the, the, the apocalyptic. I always think of Revelation as symbol first, not meant to be taken as sort of a, a drawing of what this will look like. John is trying to describe to us what is seen in this massive vision of, of, of forever, right? Uh, and so, for instance, you the, the, the idea of the sea going away. Yeah, Does that mean there's no more boating? Like, I can't go on a boat anymore? No, no, it's just there'll be no more, no evil. Yes, right? It's a symbol right. of that. Um, so there'll be moon and, 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 and sun. I, I tend to think so because God created them for a purpose. But the thing, the idea is that you won't need those for, for light. For light right? yeah. Like, the light yeah. will just be, will yeah. be from the, the light we're talking right. about here, right? right. I mean, that, that's, we talked about that last time, but that's what that light is. 
Um, so we have to be always, you know, super, super careful how we handle uh, revelation. Um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, and there's a certain trust aspect in this, too, where we trust that the God who created, you know, who, you know the loving creator, right, the one who comes to the world to save the world, um, the creation he loves, will take care of making a perfect creation um, that, that, that we will be home to. And that will be part of that. You know, will will be kings and queens in it. That will be will be rulers within this new this new creation. Um, there will be no more conflict, no more pain, no more no more tears. Um, it, it's 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 the world as it was always meant to be, and we'll live in it as we were always meant to be. Um, uh, and that's hard to even kind of imagine to some extent. Um, but it, you know, it's 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 something that we. Uh, Put our faith and trust in, um, because not because I tell you to, but because we have evidence of what God has done to make it. So uh, everything here is concrete, is real, and that, that's why that, I, I, earlier I was talking about the Israelites. Like why have Exodus? Why have all those things happened? Because having those concrete things really matter. Because if you're going to make an analogy in the Bible, it has to be a thing that actually really happened, right? Which which is which is fascinating. Like you could just have sort of an epic of something and just kind of have a made-up story and then boom, there you go. But there's a sense here that you have to have these connections to real things because this is all real. I mean, that's the thing that like that is 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 so hard to get through people's heads in a modern world where we talk about religions as sort of the fairy tales people believe. Uh, and don't get me wrong, there are a lot of fairy tales people believe. That, that's that, that's an actual thing. Uh, but the, where but where Christianity lives and dies is based on its her historical veracity. All day long. If it's either true or it's not. It doesn't matter if it makes you feel a certain way. None of that, none of that stuff matters. Is it true or is it not? Um, and uh, thank God, saints better than I have handed us down um, year after year, persecution after persecution, have given us the testimony of this truth that's happened. Um, you know, and it's alive in the scripture, obviously. Uh, it's alive in the thousands of manuscripts that have been handed down. But it's alive in the church, too. I mean, think how old the church is compared mm -hmm. to everything else in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, America's 200 years old. Yeah. The Romans were in Britain for 400 years. That's, a, that's nothing on the scale of time, right? Uh, I, I mean, you think of the kingdoms that have come and gone in the time that Christ's church has been here. There's nothing that's lasted this long. Mm -hmm. There's just nothing. Um, and, and it's a testimony to the fact that Christ won't let his church die, despite the priests and bishops and deacons and mm -hmm. lay people in. <laughs> he's just not going to let it, yeah, it's probably the human beings involved, he's not going to let it go, not going to let it die. Uh, and that's incredibly comforting, but that's a real world thing. You can look at that and go, wow, I, I, I know of no other institution that can survive like that. Uh, internationally, all over the world, in all sorts of different places, among all classes, among all, pre among all races, all, everywhere. It survived and lives and thrives. Let's talk about that. that Please. When you just mentioned, you know, the how it's we're going to live as it was intended, and mm -hmm. you know, so and that's what's kind of starting to my mind. So we're finally going to live as no matter what color, you know, great. When you said race just now, oh sure. You know, we're finally all going to live together in harmony and love. But it makes where did we go so wrong with that? That's just still so prevalent today. Oh sure. Where, where did it? Just go so wrong. Well, I mean, I mean, because Christians, I, I, it, there's, there's no room for racism in Christianity. I mean, because when John looks out over heaven, when he looks at the people who are waiting to come back to earth, which is what he's looking at, the army that's waiting, the, 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 the saints wearing white and washed in the blood of the Lamb, he sees people from every single race, every single, he sees people from all corners of the world. So anytime that any person who's been a Christian, who's, who's said they're a Christian, has said that there's room for nationalism or racism or any of those kind of stupid things. That's why, for instance, this whole alt-right movement is very, very anti-Christian, um, because they recognize that Christianity had an effect on the world that lowered and broke down barriers between people. Now, there are also times when it didn't do that, but there's no way you can read, go to all nations and preach to them, or what that actually looks like in heaven when John sees it and come away and go, oh, no, 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 there's, there's like a, there's a hierarchy in heaven or, or this group is higher than this group or this group is better than that group. 
Um, but I mean, the, the, the short answer is that we're, you know, why? Because we're scared, people who are different than us. We're scared of, you know, fear is a live thing. Um, and there are bad people out there. There's plenty of evidence. If you want evidence of bad people, that I boom. And it is a shame that it shows up in some churches that I, what's come to mind, my 96-year-old grandmother that I mentioned, uh, when she moved to Florida, Springfield sure. area, about three hours from here, little church in her neighborhood that she started to go to, when she first went there, she was told, this Christian church, you know, she needs to sit in the back. It wasn't until a new, she was told she had to sit in the back. And she is just has a heart for worship that she went. She did. Yeah. Here, God bless her. God bless her. You know. Right. And so she did it. And then when they got a new pastor, um, that's when he said, why are you always back there? And he made her come to the front. And so they have a, they actually keep her blanket cute little grandma always cold. Yeah. So she said the second pew um, from the front, she'd always sit in the far corner and uh, they keep her blanket there now. Oh, that's that's great. Oh, and, uh, yeah. yeah I mean, but, but this is a, you see what I'm saying? No, no, absolutely. Really so wrong. But, but I mean, every, you know, every age has its terrible, sinful horror. Yeah. Uh, I mean, right now we're going obviously through uh, the horrors of, of the sexual revolution. And its aftermath, uh, but I mean, there, there's no way to look at that era and and, and not go back and go. Um, people were reading into they they, they 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 were bringing into the scripture what they wanted to find. Right. Um, uh, it is impossible to get there um, from what we see uh, uh, from Jesus and the apostles um, and the message of salvation that changed from being. Um, a particular, I mean, how often does Jesus say that it's not one's ethnic stature, one nature that makes you saved, um, it's your relationship within, within, within Christ, right? Uh, I, I mean, you know, you know, a lot of these things bubble over um, in terms of, you know, how did, this, how did this really start to hit the Western world? Uh, I mean, the Enlightenment was a pretty terrible thing about this. I mean, if you were going to say that all men are created equal, okay, you're going to say that. But then you're also going to say, I'm going to enslave certain men. You had to say, but those people aren't really men. Right? It's the only way it made sense in kind of an enlightenment brain. However, you know where that's nowhere? The Bible is not an enlightenment document. It's why you can have people like Thomas Jefferson write the Declaration of Independence and own slaves. Like, that doesn't make any sense in your brain. But it does if you think about it as, as that you create these man-made enlightenment categories that are not in the Bible. Right? Like we read tonight at evening prayer about Onesimus, right? Onesimus is, uh, uh, in the book of Philemon, uh, Paul's talking about Onesimus and his master. And the, the great thing is that in Paul's mind, there's no sense in which, you know, you, he, he, he's, so, he's so in love with God that he says, you, can, you know, God is so great, you can still be a slave and still love God and it'll, it'll work out in the end. But there's a sense in which, you know, we, we know, you know, the, the great Christian tradition is that Onesimus, of course, gets freed uh, because his master can't own him anymore. It doesn't make any sense given what, what the gospel has shown him. Um, and, that, and, that, and that, frankly, is, 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 is uh, all over the tradition of the church up until the very recent, you know, I say recent, you know, 200 years is nothing to the life of the church. So in the very recent past of the church, uh, I, I mean, ethnic racism, uh, particularly in terms of color, is, 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 is an anachronistic view in the Bible. Nobody thought that. I mean, it, it's a pretty new view just in terms of most everything. Uh, <clears throat> but, of, of, of course it is, but I mean, you know, our, our, our great enemy is very, very good at doing those kinds of things to us, or finding the fault points within us and, 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 and putting pressure on those points. Um, and, and, and dragging us away, dragging us into the darkness. Um, the, that the light, uh, so you know, is a way of you know blinding us in, in, in a sense. And so that is a, a great American tragedy. Um, you know, uh, thankfully, I mean, you, you look at the work that was done to um, bring slaves the gospel um, in America, uh, and some of the brave people who did that. Um, and uh, and you know, what came out of that, of course, was a lot of saints, thank God, um, and a lot of great American Christianity and a lot of great things. I mean, there really wouldn't be an American Civil Rights Union movement if it wasn't for Christianity. I mean, people like to sort of sort of take that away from like, you know, the reverend part of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
Uh, but there's no sense, like, his rhetoric doesn't make any sense whatsoever outside of a Christian context. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that, what, what, what role does that, it doesn't make any sense what, at all. Um, and so that, that's going to continue to be a, a tough thing in our country as people try to um, uh, have movements of thought that are different, are, are outside of the, of the biblical framework. Um, I mean, for, 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 for in, in that way, that's, that's a movement of, of, of God. The same way as William Wilberforce was able, and his allies were able to abolish slavery in the British Empire um, without a war. Um, it just took, you know, decades and decades of prayer and legislation to get make it happen. But their argument was a Christian argument, and in the end, it won the day, um, because the, the idea that human beings uh, are, are able to be dissected into color groups is it's just not just not a Christian Christian idea at all. Um, so thankfully. Yes, please. Uh, aren't there readings that you would recommend uh, that would supplement our study here? Uh, of John? Yes. That's a good question. Yeah, you want to think about it. Sure. Uh, if you, you want in terms of primary literature, sort of biblical readings, or secondary literature, like like people writing about John? Probably people writing about John. Sure. I, I have been reading commentaries that we have, but yeah. I don't really address your sure, book. sure. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I mean, unfortunately, so many, so many commentaries, and fortunately and unfortunately, a lot of commentaries are written on a very, very popular level, right? Uh, and to me, you know, especially in this class, this, 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 this Wednesday night seminar, I want this to be a much deeper dive for, I want this to be something where you can't really, it's tough for you to get this necessarily from just a commentary you get from, from, from someplace. That's really what I want this class to be. Um, but I'll think, of some, I'll think of some books. I mean, I, I, you know, I have a thousand books actually. <laughs> as, as I've been preparing for this for the last few months, I've just been you know, sort of reading through it like crazy. So let me see what I can, a good, there, there are lots of good ones that I think would, would be fruitful, um, fruitful for your study. Um, but yeah, and you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to do this uh, with, with you all. Um, and, I, and I hope, hope it's, 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 it's drawn to mind. And there, there's just no, I, I, in my experience, there's just no beating going through. One great thing about studying the Greek is it forces you to slow down, which is great. And, and it forces you to really focus on what the Holy Spirit is trying to say, much more than, than, than even just, I mean, staring at the English for a long time, it's, 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 it up, but, but really trying to, you, there's a sort of a translation aspect that makes you really think hard about what the Spirit was saying. And there's a reason the Spirit gave us this in Greek, too, and that's true for the Greek and Hebrew. I mean, that, that really does matter. And so I appreciate you, 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 you bearing with me in this. Uh, and, and, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, my handwriting is really bad. No, uh, no, I was just going to ask you the same thing. Sure. No, please, yeah, no, you absolutely can. That we've been talking about. Yeah, yeah, no, sure, no, you absolutely can. Um, and, uh, no, yeah, I absolutely can. I, I apologize, my, my handwriting in Greek is, is just as bad as my handwriting in English. So, <laughs> it's, 